This episode is brought to you by Active Digital, where we help customer obsessed companies become destination brands. What you are willing to do uh, can wind up going in a lot of different directions. Um, and, and without uh, being able to have something that consistently points you in uh, a direction that aligns uh, with you know what you what you should be doing um, and having a way to determine what you should be doing uh, you, you run into problems today we are doing a deep dive on the five forces of great CX and we're starting with purpose do you want to decommoditize your products and services do you want to become a destination brand increase your revenue and have more control over your pricing, you're in the right place. Each week, we'll talk about how to create great customer experiences and how to orient your company to enable them. For your hosts, Devin and David, and this is the Experience Leader Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. I am so excited to talk about the topic that we have going on today. Uh, uh, David and I have have uh, put together a great outline. David's really bringing bringing the fire this time. I'll just go ahead and try to prepare you folks for what you're getting ready to deal oh, with. Oh, come on, man! Don't don't set me up like that. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did that on purpose. I did it on purpose. I know, I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> How you doing, man? How you doing? Uh, I am. I am well. It's. Uh, it's that I don't know. Everyone either hates this time of February or loves it. I just, uh, yeah, you come off the holidays, you get that month of like having to recalibrate. Like for me, man, this is like one of the best times of the year where it's like you're calibrated and it's like go, you know. So I, I, I love February, March. Some people I think it's like the worst time of the year for them, but uh, for me, this is like wake up every morning, like man, this is it's still early in the year, but we know what we're doing. Like this is this is good, man. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. It, it, that, uh, I, I can, I can relate to that. Like, you know, you, you know, you know what you're doing still feel like you got time. It's early in the yep. year. I, I love that. I love your perspective, uh, on that. And I do, I do enjoy, uh, uh, that part that like this part of the year for that is, you know, kind of setting goals, you know, dreaming about what can be and, and, uh, you know, get hitting the ground running, man. I do love that. No doubt. No doubt. So, uh, you know, purpose is one of, uh, you know, what I've, I've been calling the five forces of, of great CX. And, um, you know, it's, I wanted to talk about purpose first because it, it's fundamental, right? Um, we're going all the way back to, uh, uh, in the beginning, right? We're going, we're going back <laughs> to Genesis here. Um, <laughs> Why does why does your company exist? Asking asking that question, right? Um, people have all kinds of reasons why they get in business, right? Um, uh, worked at a number of places, followed a, a number of companies. Um, you, you can tell that people have all kinds of reasons for for going into business, and those things come through. Those things wind up coming through in the way that those companies do business. Um, it's it's really really hard. Uh, uh, to hide that uh, over over time, you know, some people are super, some people are super good at the rah rah game, but eventually <laughs> it's going to come out. Um, and I I I, uh, I I love some of your thoughts here on the the way that you kind of define that purpose. It's easy for some entrepreneurs, right? For some entrepreneurs, there's just such a strong sense of that it is intrinsically a part of the way that they do things. And for other entrepreneurs, it's not so easy. Can you, can you talk a little bit about kind of some of the, the way that you think about it? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the first thing, or, or you know, maybe one of the things that makes it hard for some folks is, you know, if you, if you look at an organization or a business, it doesn't matter if you're early stage or not, that, it's still a living, breathing organism, right? Uh, it's it's not a lot different from an individual in that sense. And so I think even as we kind of have this discussion today, for me, you know, like a nice sanity check is always, if you were talking about purpose in the context of an individual, 
and where that person gets their purpose from and how that drives the decisions that they make in their own life, right? Um, I think that's something that most people, I'm not saying everybody will agree on what the answer to that is, but that's certainly something that most people can wrap their heads around. Like, yeah, like everyone's got a thing that they're gonna tie to or a set of beliefs or whatever that is, right? Um, and so I think for most people, that's pretty easy when it comes to an individual. For some, at the company level, at the organization level, that's a very natural extension of like, yep, but I'm gonna go ahead and start this thing, but it's it's the same, right? It's built on certain principles. It's built on, we have a purpose for existing. Um, for other folks though, they kind of create this, this brick wall between the two and they say, well, this is just business though. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna put this piece in place and this piece in place and this piece in place, and then we're gonna hit go you know, on the machine and it's gonna kind of spit out this other thing. Um, and, you know, to your point, A, like that doesn't give, and we'll talk about this, like it doesn't really give anybody, you know, something to latch onto. But I think the bigger thing is that if, if you don't have a real problem that you're trying to solve as a business, right? If you, if you don't have something that really underlies why you exist in the first place, um, then it doesn't really, you know, you can get org structure right. You can get all the stuff right that kind of helps the, the machine go. But sooner or later, people are going to get bored, they're going to get frustrated, they're going to see through kind of what that looks like. And, you know, like all of that, it, 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 it's going to start to feel hollow, right? And this is true for individuals as well, right? It's like depending on what you're kind of tying yourself to, after a little while, like certain things in life start to feel a little bit hollow, right? And, 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 and if, you, if, you, if you find yourself in that situation, you kind of end up moving on to the next, right? Well, as a business, when people move on to the next, they are leaving as employees, they are going to the competition as your customers, et cetera, right? So it's, it is as important for companies to really say like, who are we serving and what are those problems that we're solving? Um, so that folks have the ability to really attach to that and, and start to apply some trust. Um, trust that, okay, I, I think that you can actually solve that problem for me. And even if it's not perfect in the beginning, I'm willing to hold on and and allow you as the business to work through that um, to to ultimately help me as the customer, right, or the employee. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that uh, is there's a very very interesting um, effect that it has uh, that having a strong sense of purpose that's that is um, uh, in the forefront that it has on on employees, right? Um, uh, that has on on customers that that grace. Uh, that that winds up getting given uh, yeah. because that higher sense of purpose is aligned. Uh, you know, people are willing to say, "All right, this thing isn't per isn't perfect, but I understand their intentions, and and I I agree with those intentions. So I'm not just going to switch on you." Um, yep. Yep. It, and I still, you know, I, I may not think in the moment that you have the best product or the best pricing scheme or whatever it might be. But I, I believe that you are still the best organization to help me solve this problem because you're the one that cares the most about it, right? Or you're the one that is most aligned with it or, you know, whatever whatever the right, you know, wording may be there. Um, and it, yes, like it does, it creates grace. And I don't care who you are. You can be IBM, Exxon, Apple, or you can be the little startup down the road. Like it doesn't matter. Like everybody needs grace, uh, from their customer base sometimes because every company hits those hit, hits those days where it's like, man, that that wasn't supposed to happen, right? Um, and it can either be the, that, that might be the last day <laughs> that you exist <laughs> or, or it may just be a bump in the road and you move on, right? And, and, and a lot of that has to do with how people relate to you in the first place. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that uh, the the understanding uh, winds up coming through when you're able to operate that way uh, uh, because it comes through in your actions. And that's, that's mm -hmm. a hard thing. And that's one of the reasons this is such a pillar um, in, in sort of, you know, the, the thesis that, that uh, I, I kind of have here with these five forces is because it affects the customer experience. It affects uh, the way that uh, somebody wants to and is willing to interact with, with your company. Um, same yeah. thing with employees. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I, you know, one of the things that, especially with with tech startups, you'll hear this. Uh, 
you know, it's one of like the 10 things that gets thrown around a ton, which is like the painkiller versus vitamin thing, you know, and, and in a lot of cases for specific companies, um, you'll, you'll hear founders that are very much like, we've got to be a painkiller. We can't be a vitamin, right? It's this kind of mentality of like, that's the only way I, and I, I look at that slightly differently, which is that it's, it's super important to know which one of those you are. Um, um, there is no doubt about that, right? If you, if you think you're a painkiller and, and actually you're a vitamin, right? If, if, if you think that you are solving a core need, uh, that has not been solved before, but really you're just kind of tweaking something that already exists, like you're going to look foolish real quick uh, out in the market, right? Um, and vice versa, if if you downplay the significance of what you're building um, and think of it as kind of an additive play on something that already exists, when really there's an opportunity for you to solve real pain, um, you know, um, you're, you're missing an opportunity, right? Um, but the key is, uh, as an organization, and this is something that you kind of have to continue to revisit, but you have to decide like, which of those are we going to be, you know, are we a painkiller or are we a vitamin? Um, and, and, and that to, 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 you know, to your point around really finding like where that fits, right? Like you, you, you're trying to get to, it's not just product market fit. That's a thing, but it's also like, how does this fit into the lives of our customers? Right. And that's, that is fundamentally, you know, when we think about purpose and we think about these problems that are being solved, like fundamentally, that's the question that you need to be able to answer, right? Is how does this fit into the lives of the people that 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 we call our customers? And, and that extends to employees as well in a, in a slightly different capacity. But um, that that ends up being like the most important question that you can ask. Um, and and that's your that's your sanity check, right? That's your like, hey, does this thing does this thing actually hold water? You know? Totally. And, and I think that, uh, you know, again, for those, for those, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and business leaders who, you know, who have a, a strong sense of purpose, who think that way already, um, that, that can be a very easy thing, um, uh, to do. Uh, and they have other areas, right? Like we we all have a jagged profile, right? Everybody, everybody, hmm. you know, has strengths and weaknesses, and, you know, uh, uh, I tend to be one of those very, uh, very strongly purpose driven people. I got other areas that, that, you know, that, that I need help in, right. Uh, for some folks, um, who don't think about this, uh, uh, as much, they know, you know, they know market fundamentals. Well, they, they know finance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They don't think in these terms, uh, uh, very often this can be, uh, you know, something that takes a lot of focus, but, um, it's important. It's important to think this way. Uh, it's important to, uh, be able to, to set this, um, because it, it winds up being a, a fundamental piece. It is the foundation of your mm -hmm. company's strategic decision-making ability. Um, and, and even, even at a, at a, at a lower level than that, you talk, you, you talked about, um, you know, people having a, a set of beliefs. If you're not operating from a, a core set of beliefs, uh, the, what you are willing to do, uh, can wind up going in a lot of different directions. Um, and, and without, uh, being able to have something that consistently points you in uh, a direction that aligns, uh, with, you know, what you, what you should be doing, um, and having a way to determine what you <laughs> should be doing, uh, yeah. you, you run into problems. No doubt, man. I mean, I think that's the, um, and, and, you, and you got it right. You know, everybody, everybody, for some people, this topic comes very naturally and it's like, yeah, of course you have to do that first. Um, most people would nod their head to it, but I do think there, there, there is a, there, there are a group of folks that just like this, this doesn't come as naturally, right? Because, you know, they might be a bit more cerebral or they might be more focused on the mechanics of, well, how do you, how do you execute on this? Which is great too. Like it takes, it takes all types, but, um, that isn't to say that it's okay to kind of operate without purpose, because the truth is for all of the operating that you want to do for the decision making that you're going to need to do all of that. Right. You hear again, back to like all of these buzzwords that, that tend to like get injected into every startup book. You know, it's like first principles is another one of those, right. Where it's always like, we'll fall back to first principles. Fall. Okay. But here's the thing, like when you're distilling that down and trying to compare it against where you're headed, trying to like, if you don't have anything to actually compare it against, then then it doesn't really do you a whole lot of good to dis to distill something down, 
into its core pieces, right? Um, uh, you can go through the exercise and that's great. That gets you part of the way there. But if there's no OS that you're tying into in the first place, you know, um, at, at the end of the day, what, what is that really going to get you? You know, I, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when you still had to actually buy, I mean, maybe I'm not old enough for the big old floppies, but I'm certainly old enough for the, like those, those CDs still came in the mail if you wanted to install <laughs> software. And like, you know, if you had a Mac or even a, a, a 386, but that thing was made for a, a 486 PC, like it just wasn't going to work. Like it doesn't, like you can put it in as many times as you want. Like that, like that, that's never going to work on your machine. Right. Um, and, and, you know, now, now it's like, okay, well, I, I kicked, I clicked the wrong button on Chrome. Let me open up the other <laughs> one. And it's, you know, the, the pain isn't quite as real anymore, but that OS is critical. Um, and, the software that runs on the OS only exists because the OS is there, right? And it's the same, it's that same type of concept of, you know, you want the ability to be able to tie back. And, and you know, you mentioned the word consistency. For me, especially as a leader, um, consistency is, is overlooked so often. Um, and, you know, consistency can mean a lot of things. A lot of people will tie that to habits and cadences and all these sorts of things, which are important. Those are good tools. But consistency in decision making in the sense that you're always tying back to your, you know, to, to your purpose, that I'll tell you what, that that is a powerful, powerful thing. And people can feel that um, that is not it's not frou frou. It's not like people people will they will feel when that's happening and they will feel when it's not happening. Absolutely. They will. Um, uh, I one of the reasons it's on this list is because. Uh, I've, I've watched that, uh, uh, you know, for, for 20 years, I've watched that and, uh, realized that it, it is, uh, such a driving force, uh, for people's decision to, uh, engage themselves for them to decide that they are, uh, going to give more of themselves to something. Um, no for somebody being willing to pay more for somebody, you know, as we talked about before being willing to give grace. Um, it's such a driving force of that. People can absolutely feel that it tells them, uh, without them having to collect a lot of other information, it tells them whether to take you seriously. Um, it tells them whether to trust you. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, you're absolutely right. You, you, it's okay. Uh, if this doesn't come as naturally uh, uh, out of the gate, I'd say it's something that everybody needs to work on. It's not okay to leave it blank. Um, and <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> it is not okay to leave it blank. <laughs> yep. Yeah. This is, this is not an optional part of, uh, establishing, you know, uh, establishing what it means for your organization to exist. So pur purpose has got to be there. I, I almost feel like this should be the first thing we talk about and we should like come back to it when we get to the end, because, uh, it's, it is the most important thing to, to check yourself on as a, as a leader, you know? Totally, totally. And, and, uh, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you talked about, you talked about, um, you know, being a leader and, you know, essentially this helps you, um, fundamentally be able to make those strategic decisions. A, a leader is the one who has to be able to be given the blank sheet of paper and to be able to put down what should be. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't have this, that blank sheet of paper is scary. That blank sheet of paper is, is terrifying. Um, if you do have this, it's probably still scary, but l less scary, far less scary. <laughs> uh, if you, if you do have this, no, there's no doubt. And it's also, you know, the, the, the other part of that too, is regardless of what you write down on that, you know, proverbial sheet of paper, uh, it, it getting it right you know, quote unquote, whatever, whatever that means. Uh, and, and maybe that varies day to day, but getting it right becomes a function of luck, frankly, if you don't have this, right. It's like, okay, well, we, we set a direction or we made a decision on something that was somewhat strategic. Great. And, you know, maybe it worked out, maybe it didn't, but you know, it's like, if, if you're not, if you're not tying into, you know, if you're not tying into the purpose that frankly, like your customers, your employees, all of your stakeholders have, have come to know you for, uh, or, or are searching for in your organization, then the truth is that result isn't really tied to anything. It, it, in other words, you can have a positive result that actually doesn't, doesn't move the needle nearly as much as it might 
feel like it should, you know, like, hey, that was a win. Well, okay, yeah, that was a win. But when you have that thing come up again, guess what? You're basically going to be starting from zero again, you know? And so it doesn't really move things forward. Yeah, no, that that is, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, been in those situations many times where it's like, man, like it was, it was some progress, but it felt like it, like it should have been bigger. We should have been able to leverage that more. What, you know, what, yep. what's going on and, and uh, you know, feeling like you're just kind of hitting the numbers every now and again, as opposed to having, uh, having the sauce, having the formula down, um, yep. uh, you know, that, and, and that uh, ties in as well, you know, the, the, this uh, other point that, that you have about, you know, it elevating uh, your thinking beyond short term, uh, transactional thinking. Um, I, I love that, man. I'd love for you to kind of break that down for folks. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we talked about grace earlier. Um, and and I, I love that term. I think I think that there is a, a even a business version of that that has to exist just human to human, you know, like it just, it's, it's part of us interacting with each other. Um, but there's also a, a probably a corollary to that or something that's related, right? Which just has to do with how willing are people, uh, again, this can be your employees, customers, et cetera, but how willing are people to, uh, you know, the old, the, it's the 76 is like trust the process side of this thing, right? Where it's like, how willing are folks to trust the process and say, you know what, like, that thing, like, that was a little rocky, right? Like, the way we did that or the way you guys rolled that out or, you know, whatever that might be, like, that wasn't perfect. Um, but, like, I still see where this thing is headed. And and as a stakeholder, where this thing is headed, in my head, is no different than where I would have said it was headed two months ago before that weird thing happened in between, right? Um, and on the flip side of that, when good stuff happens, right, uh, uh, you, 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 you put out a feature that just happens to be amazing and it kind of like gets a lot of good buzz, right? You, uh, you get a couple of wins that maybe you weren't expecting and it's a little bit of that artificial like. Um, and and this, is, this is a hard thing for entrepreneurs, especially because everybody wants the wins and everybody wants to feel like everything good that happens is now, you know, kind of a, that, that, that's an indicator that like that J curve is just around the corner, right? But it's keeping expectations in check on that side as well, which is, yo, like, that's good. I'm glad that good thing happened, but stay the course, right? Like, we're not here for the spikes. Like, those are going to happen, but that's not why we're here, right? We're here to make a lasting difference in this way, and that's a journey. And so stay on the journey. But if you can, if you can get people out of short-term thinking, then they don't get too high, they don't get too low, um, which means that again, back to that consistency piece, like you can stay the course. And that is incredibly important for longevity. Um, it's also important for people just, you know, especially we're seeing this more in the last couple of years, but um, people are taxed, you know? And so these like huge emotional swings, the huge swings and everything is great, everything is broken, like it's not good. Um, it's not good for anybody. And so, um, having that kind of those big rocks that people can tie to where they're like, all right, but you guys, you know, you're still you like, that's important. That's, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> the, the, uh, ability to, to evaluate whether we're, you know, we're still us, right? Like I've been, you know, I've been at multiple companies where we grew past a certain size. Um, we, you know, the, the company wound up having to make certain decisions, uh, along the way. And it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel the same anymore. And you know, it's not going to feel the same. You can't expect something to feel the same all the time. Uh, but having that ability to evaluate, are we still us? Yep. Um, is, is this still something that I, that I align with? Because it's one of the, the biggest things that purpose allows somebody to do is to decide whether or not they uh, agree, decide whether or not they uh, uh, yep. are, are with the program. And if they, if you can make that decision, um, everything else becomes a lot simpler. If you can't, um, you know, the, the chance of, of, you know, making, a, a the chance of somebody deciding to make a switch, whether that's an employee or a customer, um, it just, it just becomes a lot more uh, easy, becomes a lot more likely, um, if they can't make that decision. And sometimes you want people actually to make the decision. I'm not with this. Um, 100%. this isn't what I 100%. want. Um, you want those folks to be able to make that decision because if they stick around because they don't know, 
you have problems there too. And every single business leader that, that's been around for any amount of time knows this. Yep. Yep. No, and it's uh and there is a scaling element to that, which is if if the only way that people find out about the, if, if if the only way that people hit those decision points, right? Your customers, your employees is is when you know one or two people open their mouth and kind of give a speech or give a little rah-rah or send out an email or whatever that might be. If that's the only mechanism that you have for communicating, I'll put purpose in quotes because at that point it, it's not so much purpose as it is like this is the thing that I think is going to play in the moment, right? With with this particular group of people, and that's not purpose. That's uh, that's that's manufactured words for the you know for the sake of of maybe getting some smiles or whatever. But um, if that's the only only mechanism that you have to get that out, then you will always have a lot. The bulk of your folks will be stuck in the middle. And you are exactly right. That's a bad place to be because there are going to be times where they appear to be on the boat only for you to find out that they are not on the boat at all when when it when when the rubber hits the road, you know, um, and vice versa. Right. There'll be there might be times where things look worse than they really are because you just didn't give somebody something to opt into. And I don't mean that from a tactical standpoint, but I mean, emotionally, um, like from a purpose standpoint, like, are they opting into what you're all about? Like you want people to make that choice. You want people to have a, uh, a feeling of what that purpose is so they can make that choice without having it sort of shoved down their throat, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love, I love that. Um, because that whole, uh, that whole, uh, uh, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm in, but I'm, but I'm not really in yep. thing. Um, it, you only find out, you only find out, like you said, when the rubber meets the road, you find that, out at the worst possible time. That's <laughs> that it. Somebody that's is it. not in. Never, I was having this conversation this morning with some guys about, uh, you know, it's as humans, I think we like to take difficult situations that we might read about or hear about and, and our natural sort of safe way of internalizing those is to take that thing and attach it to us at a time of strength, right? And say, okay, well, yeah, like we, we, can, you know, as a company, as a person, like we can probably handle that. It's like, yo, it never, it never happens that way though. <laughs> like, you know, when that thing is going to hit you is when you were at your weakest point, right? It's going to be when you can't afford to do that thing that you now absolutely need to do, right? Or when you don't have the time to pontificate you don't have the time to do the research and you're going to have to decide right now right and to your point like when you when you scale that out to your customers and to the folks that rely on the organization um it is in those moments that are no longer within your control as an organization you don't have the ability to control that narrative or that situation um and so it's going to come down to like do the are those folks in it or are they not? And and how and and what is that tied to? Right? Is it tied to that last like rah rah thing you threw out for the quarter, or is it tied to the ethos of the company? Right? Is it tied to the purpose? And the, that's a big difference. Totally. No. There's it, and and that is, uh, you know, there's people are always making, um, they're always making decisions uh, day in and day out. Every time somebody decides to use your product, use your service. Um, they are making a decision about whether to continue uh, to do that. Um, you know, in, in, in jobs theory parlance, that's the little higher, right? The little higher is, do I keep using it? Right. Um, uh, but you know, without putting any sort of special language on it, we just, you know, we know that that's what we do. We, we're, we're always evaluating, is this the best experience? Is this the experience that I want to have? Right. And so you wind up, you wind up having to, uh, enable somebody to, to make, uh, that decision. A lot of times people are making moral calls. Part of that regular decision-making people are making moral calls. Sometimes you have to make uh, a moral call that is you're thinking to yourself, this probably is not going to look great on the balance sheet. Um, this is, this is potentially not going to look awesome, um, uh, to everybody, uh, in the market. If I have to make this call, um, but I know that I have to do it. And it's, in, it's interesting to see um, situations where a, a company does something that seemingly um, financially would not be in their best interest. But people look at that and they recognize they clearly did not do that just out of their own self-interest. They did that because they stand on a principle. And that causes a just ferocious attachment to that brand 
by the right people. And, and you can't get that without having that, that clear sense of, uh, of purpose. There's no doubt, man. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, the attraction piece of that, right. Of like, okay. So, you know, like all those things are, are so true. And I think there's, there's that longevity component to that then that, you know, and we, we've kind of been hitting on this already a little bit, but, you know, just this idea that you, like, it, it, it's the little hires, right. But that, that occurs with your employee base as well. It's like, people are making that choice every day to either lean in or not, you know, as a customer, it's, I'm either going to kind of continue being a customer or not. And that, that might show up on the balance sheet. It might show up as they're literally making a choice of buy or no buy renew or not renew. But there's also, you know, even, even to make it like somewhat mechanical, like there are a lot of other metrics though, like in the software world that comes down to like, okay, but like usage is going way down. Like we're still for now, they're still paying customer, but listen, like we can, we can see like the writings on the wall, right? Like these people are not logging in. They're not using this thing anymore. Um, they're choosing to kind of, you know, go elsewhere, et cetera. Um, from an employee standpoint that looks in, you know, very specific ways of like, okay, we can see engagement is backing off a little bit. And all of that comes back to, yeah, are, do people wake up whether, whether their intended interaction with your company or brand is five seconds or all day, every day, right? Um, they are making that choice and it is a lot, it is a lot healthier for an organization to ensure that that choice can be made on, on some things that are very clear. Right. And again, that doesn't, it's okay. If some people actually choose at some point to move on, like that's, that's part of this. Right. Um, but so it's not to say that like retaining all the people all the time is the answer. If you try to do that, like everybody will kind of, you know, slip out from underneath you. Right. But there is an element of, it's not, it's not just about attracting in the short term and maybe getting the right buzzwords out there that would, would cause somebody to be like, Ooh, yeah, I, I like that purpose. But it's, it's about how often that person still feels inclined to make that choice so that they stick around. Right. Which for, for any business, I mean, that's, that's how you grow. Right. Um, you know, uh, net new is great. Um, obviously you want to be able to branch in the new markets, new logos in the B2B world, et cetera, like all that stuff, of course, but keeping people around, um, finding ways to increase value to your existing customers like that, that comes from that strong sense of, you know, I, I want to be a part of what these guys are doing. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, that is, that is huge. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, that whole, that whole, uh, concept of attracting, right? We're always either attracting, we're either always attra attracting or repelling somebody mm -hmm. from our, our company. We're always doing that. And, and, um, you know, when, when we have this strong, this strong sense of, of purpose that comes through in our actions, comes through in our words, comes through in the way that we, that, uh, uh, we do our day to day, um, you know, people are either attracted or repelled. The right people are attracted, the wrong people are repelled. Um, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, to, to get moral again, it, they might be repelled if you're, if your purpose is wrong. Um, <laughs> if your, if your actions are wrong, they might just be repelled because of that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we're either, we're always doing one or the other. And that sense of loyalty is what comes from continually attracting somebody with that. Um, and so I, I think that it is something that you, you got to watch out for, because if you don't have that there, if you don't have that, if that strong sense of purpose isn't coming through, especially to your employees, right? Let's just talk about, let's talk about employees for a second. If that's not there for those folks, um, you, you wind up uh, putting somebody in a situation where, where they don't know, you know, what you talked about the middle, that sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, that squishy middle where you don't know. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's the sort of thing that if you do that, guess what? You created a culture that is prone to attracting clock pushers because yep. they just need a job. Right. And anybody who who's ever led a business knows that somebody who just needs a job can be helpful for a bit, but when the rubber meets the road, that person is not as invested as you need them to be to help you and everybody else at the company get to where you need to go. 
No doubt. No, I mean, that's the, and, and I think that's why, you know, back to the painkiller versus vitamin thing. I think that's why a lot of, especially early stage entrepreneurs will have this kind of like heavy visceral reaction to, you don't want to be a vitamin, right? Because they, and, and this isn't, this is, this is correct thinking in the sense of, I think their version of the vitamin from a customer standpoint is you don't want that non-committal customer that's going to use you for a month, but then as soon as the next shiny thing comes out that's like a slightly better vitamin, they'll just jump to that one and you're kind of left in the cold as a as an organization. Like that's that that's kind of the underlying thought. I think we all know that. But um the, you know, and, and this is true like from an employee standpoint as well, where it's like, but that that isn't the only definition of a vitamin, and it's not the only definition of how you engage your employees, right? Um the idea that you can actually continue to make something better and you understand why folks are choosing you, right? And this comes back to, as an organization, defining purpose and then being willing to, I, I, I love that you kind of call out that like you're either attracting or repelling, right? And, and if you can take that nice strong stance internally um, to, to that concept, uh, what it forces you to do is really, I, two things, right? One is, do we even have the data to know whether we're attracting or repelling, right? I mean, yes, on a one-off basis, we might see some some data points come in. Somebody literally leaves a, a review that's either good or bad, right? Um, maybe some employee feedback or we run like a, you know, NPS, like, you know, uh, for, for employees or something like those are all tools. But do you even have the data to really know, like, are we attracting or repelling? And not just like, Overall, but with with meaningful, you know, cohorts break, broken out that actually suggest that you're doing that with the groups of folks that you intend to attract or repel, right? Um, and the other thing is, like, are we being when when it gets hard, right? When things get busy and you're struggling to scale, and maybe you know, COVID hits and all the other stuff that happens to businesses that makes it hard. Um, the easy thing to do is to say, okay, like it doesn't seem like people hate us. So we're just going to go ahead and like be okay with the fact that it's somewhere in, in between versus we need to keep revisiting. Like, are we attracting, are we repelling and breaking that down into those cohorts that matter? Right. Because, um, into those business problems that matter, like for the people that have the problems that we set out to solve in the first place, are we continuing to meet those problem sets in the way that we are saying we're meeting them? Um, and having the ability to answer that question, you know, yes, in a perfect world, just on demand whenever, but at minimum, like on some sort of regularity, it is a big differentiator between brands that are, you know, all the brands that we know that have, that have elevated themselves to that level. Like those folks can do that. And I, I'm not sure that everybody understands just how well those brands are able to do that, but, but like, just, you know, like be educated on that. Like those folks, they know the answer to that question every day. Um, but it's hard. Uh, if it was easy, then there would be more fortune 100s, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but it isn't. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, that, that is a super important kind of operational element to this though, is like, can you actually answer the question? And are you willing to judge yourself on the answer to that? Even when it feels like things are going okay. Oh, man. Oh, I love that, man. I love that. Are you willing to ask a question? Um, yeah. When stuff is when stuff is is going swimmingly, are you willing to ask a question? We're not we're not saying we're not saying to second guess yourself. We're not saying that we're just saying to, you know, always, always do the check. Right. Always do the gut check. Um, yep. and, and and that's huge. You know, you're talking about talking about brand here. Uh, I mean, purpose is is a massive part. It's a massive part of your, your brand identity. It's the heart. It's the heart of your brand identity. Whenever I work with a company on brand, that's the, that's the first thing that we wind up talking about. And that's the first thing I have us talk about, uh, is purpose. And, and it's funny to me to see who, uh, uh, who winds up saying like, what, why do we need to talk about that? And, and the people who are, are like, oh yeah, yeah. Like that, that makes sense. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think that, uh, obviously, you know, as, as you mentioned, the brands, the brands that, that understand that they wield a tremendous amount of power. Um, the brands that get that, that, that understand that wield a tremendous oh, amount of power. Yep. Yep. And it's, you know, one thing that I, to, you know, just to kind of put it into like nice layman's terms, right. Is like, just 
there's that gut check as a customer of like, do I feel like a brand is chasing somebody or not? Right. And that's just a nice little litmus test. But, you know, I mean, you're, you're in Atlanta, like you've got two good examples with, with Chick-fil-A and Coke of like, like, like Chick-fil-A is not chasing McDonald's. I'm sorry. Like that. No, nobody, there's nobody in their right mind that would be like, yeah, man, they just, it seems like everything they do, they're just trying to, they're just trying to catch McDonald's and Subway. Like, no, no, that's, that's actually not like, no one thinks that, right? Not a thing. Like, not a thing. Like, no offense to Pepsi, like love the halftime show, mainly because I'm old and you know, whatever. <laughs> but like, listen, nobody thinks the Coke is chasing Pepsi. Like for the last 20 years, like as much as Pepsi has tried to change that narrative, like there is not one person that's like, yeah, man, Coke, Coke just keeps trying to catch up to Pepsi. It's like, no, nah, it's like, but you ask people if Pepsi's trying to chase Coke, like, yeah, most people are gonna be like, yep, they're just nipping away, <laughs> right? They're just they're just still trying. And again, like, no, no offense to any of the brand. Like, only one person can be in the big boy seat. I get that, but there is something to be said for like there is a when when your brand hits that point, like you are no longer chasing, um, and no one thinks of you that way. So when you make changes, um, people don't think that you're making that change because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. People think you're making that change because you believe that it's the right thing to co to continue to fulfill your purpose. And like, man, that is a big, big difference, right? I mean, just just flat out. And I'm not to say, you know, you can Taco Bell's the king of like the gimmicky, like you know, like, and they, they've actually built. It's funny, like they've. This is sort of like a weird meta thing, right? They've almost built a brand on being gimmicky yeah. um, to some degree. Like that's a that's a that's kind of an inception thing that we don't need to get into. But <laughs> you know, but the point is like that that ability to stand on your own two feet and say hey like when we do things everybody knows it's intentional and we don't even have to say it um versus all right we're gonna do this thing and everyone's probably gonna think it's because we're trying to chase and so you know like it's it's a big difference absolutely yeah i, I think that uh it, you know one of the one of the great examples uh, for me is like you know something uh something happens or you know apple makes a decision and my assumption is that it was a very purposeful decision. And I have to be willing to like take off my fanboy hat <laughs> and say, okay, like, but why did they really do this? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh -huh. But it's, you know, it's funny to get in discussions and, uh, you know, with my friends and, they, you know, they'll make the assumption, oh, they just did that because like they can charge that much or whatever. You know, the people who are turned off from Apple, yep. like that's their, their, their position. It, you know, sometimes it's rational, sometimes it's not. Um, uh, but like, yeah, the the ability to to get that trust, to get that trust from people that that says, okay, uh, they clearly made this decision because it aligns with their purpose. It's you know, I know that that's how they operate. I've seen them do that long enough. That's yep. how they operate. This is probably the reason why they did this. Um, is is super super impactful. Um, and and you know, you kind of uh, you kind of touched on on the whole. Uh, idea of not chasing, not chasing somebody. This is what helps you to get in that position that this is what puts yep. you there. The companies, all the companies that are in that spot who are not chasing anybody, they got there because of purpose. Uh, yep. They have purpose. They make decisions based on purpose, not based on what their competitors are doing. Uh, that, and, and I'm not saying that, that it happens that way every single time, right? Nobody's perfect. Um, uh, but the ones that are in there that stay there, th that's how they got there. There's, there is no doubt. And that goes back to our, like, this is not a pur purpose is not a field that you get to leave blank, you know? Um, like, and that's, that's why, right? Because if you, if you, you can leave it blank, but there, there are consequences, right? Um, uh, consequences that are, you know, fatal in some cases to organizations In other cases, it just means that for, for, per, you know, in perpetuity, you will always be, you know, nipping at the heels of other people. Um, and that's almost worse in some ways, you know, it's like a almost, you'd almost rather not exist in that purgatory, but that's like, that's the, the that's the deal, right? Like you, you either, you either have one or you don't. And, and there are some very clear consequences to what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, t the, talking about consequences, right? Um, uh, I want folks to consider uh, a couple insights from from Jen Lim over at, over at Inc. Magazine. I've mentioned these on the show before, but they bear repeating here. Um, uh, so she writes, you know, two researchers, uh, Millard Brown and Jim Stengel, developed a list of the world's 50 fastest growing brands, you know, FedEx, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, for example, 
Um, and based on 10 years of empirical research involving 50,000 companies, um, th this is known as the Stengel 50. And it was found that those purpose-driven companies saw 400% more returns in the stock market than the S&P 500. 400%. Only 400. Only. <laughs> only 400. It, yeah, man. You know, like, yeah, uh, <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you say to that? Right. Yep. I yep. mean, no, it's, it's wild. Right. And it's like, it's funny when we say all this stuff out loud, it makes sense. But, um, uh, but it, you know, for whatever reason, it's for some folks, it's still hard to start there, but, um, yeah, man, like it's, that's, that's pretty black and white. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I got another one for you. Uh, great place to work found that 85% of employees at Fortune 100 companies, uh, they reported that special meaning and, and, and it not just being a job came from having that purpose. That, that companies that are purpose-driven, their employees say that this is not just a job for me. Um, those employees are 11 times more committed to staying at the company, 14 times more likely to look forward to coming to work. Um, that, that is giant. Anybody who's ever managed anybody knows how giant that is. And that is, you know, we talk about consistency in decision-making, uh, consistency or sorry, uh, like, you know, decisions that are grounded in purpose and all that stuff. But you know, what else helps consistency a lot is like actually having the same humans there for a while to, to make those decisions, um, having them mentor the next generation of folks that then come up and make those. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, uh, being a 40 year, you know, employee at a place is the only way to go about it, but it does say a lot about what those, um, what those lasting principles look like, you know, in, in companies that have that set of purpose. I mean, again, like that's, that's some pretty significant data right there. Right. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 10 X more committed to, to, to staying like, like these are, that's not like a two X or a 1.5 X. I mean, these are, those are big multiples and, um, and you see it, you, you see it in the people that are there. Um, and, and you see it in their ability as an organization to have that, that type of longevity. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, and again, what we're talking about is the thing, the thing that helps you predict your ability to generate these awesome results, right? Having, yep. having that there allows you to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you, you, uh, you said it well, uh, when you said that, you know, the, the premium brands, they, they have that strong sense of purpose, uh, that's, that's clear. And it, it, they always have that strong sense of purpose. That's clear to the markets, uh, uh, that they serve. A hundred percent. I think that again, these are, it, it sometimes takes stepping back, you know, if, if for, for leaders that are in it and, and, and every day is kind of, you know, the usual chaos and it can be a little bit of a circus and all that fun stuff. But like, you, you have to, you have to be able to step back for a minute and look at some of that raw data and just, or, or just a straight gut check on, Hey, what are those brands that I actually attach to? What are the, what, what's the reason for that? Um, for the brands that I have a strong attachment to, what's the reason for that? Right. And, and, and as you, as any consumer, which we all are, um, that that's the fun thing about this stuff, right. Is like, you don't have to, um, like there's no layer of translation here, right? Um, you don't have to say, well, well, what if I was a consumer? Well, okay, but you are. Um, so like you, you just have to put yourself in that position and say, like, well, what is it about those brands and those companies? And it becomes very, very clear. Um, that level of attachment, the reason that you're able to do that and what that means to you as a consumer and then the market at large, um, it is... It, 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 it is not a minor thing. You know, this is, this is, um, important stuff and it, and it's, and it, and it drives all the things that we've been talking about today. Yeah, man. Um, I, I can't, I can't even add anything to that, man. That's, that's, uh, that, that's the perfect bow on it. Uh, so I, I think that that is, is a, a great summation of, you know, kind of our, you know, where our flag is in the ground on this. And, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, it's not our truth. It's just the truth. You can look at out in the market, look at the results and judge for yourself. 
Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to take that to the bank and a bunch of other companies are taking it to the bank. So, uh, if, if you want to take it to the bank, I, I suggest highly, uh, that everybody put this high on the list of priority, uh, in, in their boardroom, uh, uh, on their executive team, uh, with their management teams, that this is something that, uh, not only do you have a clear sense, uh, about, but that it is coming out in all the decisions that you make, um, so with that, uh, I, I just want to wrap up the show by kind of talking about, you know, what's, what's good in, in your life, man. I'm going to start, I'm going to start with you, David. Yeah, man. Uh, reading, uh, reading a couple books right now. I, I'm that guy that's got like six books on the nightstand always, which, uh, I don't know, seems a little bit, um, inefficient, but that's just kind of, so I, you know, I'm, I'm always reading like three things at once instead of just knocking one out, which would probably be smarter. But, uh, uh, I've been, dude, I've been rereading the, uh, the culture code by Daniel Coyle. Um, part of that is just like super right now for me, like that's a super interesting topic. Obviously it's, it, it's interesting at large for a lot of people as we see what's happening in the, in the job market and just like what companies are trying to produce. But um, just revisiting some of those topics around transparency, vulnerability, like what it means to actually build real culture. Funny thing is, like we're talking about purpose in this conversation, like guess what? That's a part of that equation as well. So um, uh, yeah, man. So so enjoying diving back. It's a book I've read a couple of times. It's an oldie but goodie, but um, one that I'm back in. And then my like my kind of, I say this, I mean, it's not, it's probably not fair to Mr. Smith because uh, he's, he's a businessman, but uh, I was going to say my non-business book at the moment. Um, I'm reading Will Smith's autobiography. I'm, I'm always fascinated by folks who have managed to, uh, to just have their hands in a lot of things and be successful at a lot of things, uh, at least in terms of output. Right. And I'm not like, and, and actually I think his book's a good example of like pointing out kind of the details of like, it's not easy. And frankly, like it can be pretty ugly under the covers sometimes, but like just the, just the sheer output and, and how you even like shoulder that load as an individual is always fascinating to me. You know, you look at, man, I'm watching the Super Bowl of like the rocks doing the intro. I'm like, <laughs> How did that guy like like isn't he doing like 57 other things? Like, how did he get his butt <laughs> to LA to to be doing the intro? I, I like did he even have time to practice it, or is that just is he just riffing like in front of a hundred million people and hoping it goes out all right? So, I thought the, the same thing. The, these dudes, like uh, and women too, like the people that are just out there, like, whoa, like I don't even know how you do all those things at once, but I'm interested. So, like, let me let me read up on that a little bit. So, yeah, man, that's that's what I'm diving into these days. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, no, I've thought I thought the same thing when I saw the rock up there. I'm like, <laughs> dude, what are you not doing right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> aren't you busy? <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm back for, to to my childhood. Uh, the Rock was my favorite wrestler. Uh, when me and my cousins would pretend to be wrestlers, that was my guy. That's who I would pretend to be. And I think that for as long as he's done that, they could have just got him out of the stands, handed him the mic and say, <laughs> hey, <laughs> Dwayne, so introduce yeah. these two teams. And he would have done it just like that. Easy. <laughs> there is no doubt. There is no doubt. <laughs> so so uh, mine is uh, I'm finally going to read. I just I just picked the book up. Um, finally going to read the innovators dilemma. Um, and like this book is famous. It's, it's by Clayton Christensen. Um, it's a famous book, a classic business book. Um, and it's known as one of the only business books that Steve jobs ever admitted actually impacted his life <laughs> and the way he does business. Um, so I, I think I've put this off long enough. Um, I read, I read, uh, competing against luck, which was kind of the, um, the reason I put it off was because competing against luck is considered to be the actual, um, uh, the sort of crystallization of, of the theories that, uh, you know, uh, Clayton was, was poking at in the innovators dilemma, but it still gets so much hype that I'm like, all right, man, I can't, I can't uh, sit on this any longer. I need to go ahead and read this thing. So I picked Love it up. It. I'm going to read it. Maybe, maybe some point we'll do a, uh, we'll do a book review on it, but, uh, uh it's I'm, a great book, man. Yeah. I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, of course you've already read it. David's David <laughs> reads everything, man. David, this guy is so cultured, man. <laughs> I don't, I don't know about that, but that, that one's on the list at least, yeah. man, that is, that is awesome. Um, well, yeah. So, uh, I think that, uh, you, everybody, you got a, a great list of uh, just 
stuff to be able to go and and, and grab onto if if uh, any of the insights that we talked about are actually you know valuable to you at all uh you know these are these are some of the sources uh, you know we're giving we're giving you some of our sources these are some of the places that these insights are coming from um I, you know i'm i'm always trying to get stuff from people who i consider smarter than myself uh and uh the, these are, are some of the places that, that I've been able to find it. And I love kind of, I feel like I'm getting cheat codes here because I'm getting some of David's reading list because David is, is uh, yeah, I'll, I'll brag on him. He's pretty daggum smart and, and I'm trying to like steal some of his some of his intellect there. Um. <laughs> Man, I, don't, I, I was about to say that it's pretty easy for me to find people that are smarter than me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to meet those people too. <laughs> but uh, uh, folks, if you enjoyed what you listened to, uh, we would really appreciate you uh, liking, subscribing, um, uh, leave a review for the podcast on iTunes. Um, uh, really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, feel free to follow us uh, uh, online. We're both on LinkedIn, uh, Devin Smith, David Aniline. And until next time, keep outserving your competition on your relentless pursuit to become an experienced leader. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs>